Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be here. As uh, I was in introduced, I've been in the financial inclusion mass market retail business for 35 years or so, uh, starting before there was such a word as microfinance. And uh, for the past 20 years, I've led the vertical market within Temenos for inclusive banking, which is really mass market retail in emerging markets. And Temenos has a marketplace to develop relationships with fintech companies that can be introduced to its client base. Temenos has about 3,000 banks around the world that they call clients, at least 1,000 running end-to-end -end core, front-end, back-end services. So it's a large ecosystem. And our client base in Temenos is always looking for innovation, looking for, for fintech, and opportunities has been the topic this morning. So we created a marketplace. And about 18 months ago, I spotted a company in the fintech marketplace that I thought could be truly disruptive, a true change agent in the, pace, in the payment space associated with retail banking in emerging markets. And not just disruptive for the sake of being disruptive, but truly transformative for the health and growth of domestic financial and regional financial markets, particularly in Africa, but in any emerging market. This is supposed to advance. <laughs> so much for technology. Oh, here we go. So I have a kind of a special long relationship with Temenos, and in that, I've been ended up being appointed of this, uh, as a director of this company, Blue Code, that I am particularly passionate about. I'm not going to give you a big pitch, but I just want to talk to you about some of the principles of financial inclusion, healthy financial markets, payments, and how we need to look at the future. First of all, what is financial inclusion? We used to think, not too long ago, financial inclusion was a virtual account with an M&O included. Not so. Financial inclusion, to me, means getting the same kind of quality service at the periphery of a financial system that you can get in the center. Because a person doesn't have a lot of money, doesn't mean they don't deserve respect. I believe that everyone in this economy and every economy needs to have a full offering of service, insurance, deposits, loans, appropriate financial services, transactional payments, and everything else that you can get in an urban area. And it has to be of quality, not some B-grade services because you happen to be in a rural area. And diverse, it's got to, it's got to serve the whole economy, men, women, children, uh, people of marginal groups, People need to be included, and it has to be accessible, easy, something that's natural, a natural extension of your day-to-day -day life. And, and finally, it has to support enterprise, because consumer credit and consumer financial services is only the skin on financial markets. We need to be able to find a way to stimulate economic development. Otherwise, what's the point? SMEs, SMMEs, need financial services and support and infrastructure to be able to grow, create wealth, and create jobs. That's what financial inclusion is to me. Okay. Since 60 years back, some of the banks that were, are here today were first established in the colonial period in Africa, back in the 20s, back in the 30s, and have morphed into large progressive African banks. Since in the past 50 or 60 years, the nations of this continent have invested heavily in creating a domestic financial market to intermediate assets for the local community, for local business and enterprise. That means the ability to serve the ordinary person, the ability to serve small business. Without that capacity, you don't have financial depth. In the past, banks, foreign banks would just serve corporates or serve their offshore interests of those companies who were extracting resources from the continent. And a huge investment has been made in building domestic financial systems and domestic payments. That is now at risk. It's at risk by big tech. It's at risk by disruptive fintech, by treating the consumer as a transaction. In Kenya, uh, you'll see the, the, the regulators getting involved in fintech because they noticed a direct correlation between microcredit at exorbitant rates of interest 
over uh, the MNO's platform, the correlation between that and online gambling. That doesn't do a whole lot for the economy or for society. I believe it's absolutely essential that, that nations take control of their financial system, their financial markets, and direct it for the health of the nation. And if this thing could go in the same direction, it'd be great. It has a lot to do with understanding people and culture. Because what is financial inclusion? What, is, what, are, what are financial systems? But offering, interacting with people's financial lives. We have to encourage people in rural areas to convert their tangible assets into a financial form and intermediate those through a system of credit competition and allocation to the best idea to create wealth. That's a basic engine of development. But we have to understand people to do that. Now there's challenges in doing that and we've been learning for the past 30 years how to do that. Understanding the customer, understanding the the, the space, uh, legacy systems, costs. These are all obstacles to reaching that client base. But we've learned very recently that the poor will pay. They'll pay a premium and they'll repay because they respect the relationship and it's very important. We must not exploit that vulnerability. We must treat them with respect and give them quality services. But then at the same time, just because you repackage what you've done all along and present it in a digital form doesn't mean that they're going to be consumed. Oftentimes banks think that they're doing a great job, but they're pushing the transaction cost onto the client and other obstacles that make it uh, difficult for small business and consumers to consume those financial services. Now, I see some major trends. First of all, everyone talks about competing with cash. Absolutely, cash is, cash is trusted because it's tangible but it's also expensive because you have to take it somewhere to exchange it. So we know that cash needs to be replaced to increase efficiency in the marketplace and it's a complex story. Cards have been seen as the replacement. So instead of putting cash in your hand, you now have a piece of plastic that you walk to a point of sale terminal. So you need to somehow get the plastic and the point of sale terminal everywhere. Not easy. Interoperability is key. The ability to switch transaction from one financial institution or one NBFI to another seamlessly in instant time. That levels the playing field. Now these things have got a life of their own. My slides, that is. But the, the point is there are some major trends that are driving transformation. And sometimes we talk around it a little bit. Oftentimes we talk about it with a very Eurocentric kind of view of the world. We have to understand where people are and how they operate. Now, what's driving it? The youth. I've got little children in my family, you know, four-year-old goes over to the TV and tries to swipe it. These are digital natives. They don't think analog. They never have. They are natives to digital. That's the generation coming up. And they're everywhere. Just because they're using an analog phone in USSD doesn't mean they don't expect to have a digital engagement. And we need to find very simple, cost-effective ways of interacting. I think I'll just let these things move. So I want to talk to you now about what I think is truly important. To protect your payments, to protect your financial institution, to prevent the disintermediation of financial institutions from their clients, we need to have domestic and regional payment schemes. Now, all the card companies, with all due respect to the, the, the efforts that are being made by the big companies, one that you heard this morning is doing some fantastic work in building an innovation bridge between whatever type of channel and interaction you want with their back end, with their domestic, or with their legacy system. MVisa is another, which is an electronic front end to a card connected to a foreign scheme. Card schemes work, card schemes are ubiquitous, and the new digital play is connecting, trying to digitize the card experience, but they still require a point of sale, it still requires the ability to interact physically and by rules that are dictated by a couple of American corporations. So we need to find a way to get beyond that. Sort of a 
a step forward. And I wonder if this isn't a great leap backwards. Because some countries, Egypt has just announced with great pride that they have a new domestic card scheme. Fantastic. Now, how are you going to get all those point of sale terminals all across that country and get cards in people's hands and get cash points and get point of sale terminals and get all that infrastructure in place in a single lifetime? Africa skipped the landline and went to mobile. That was a leap forward. The modern or the, the more advanced uh, financial markets we've been hearing about, say, in the UK, they're skipping it. They're going straight to digital. That is the future. So why would we go cards when there are digital payment scheme options available now? My question. So why P2B? I, I'm talking about P2B. This is effectively a digital interaction, a token interaction with a business, with a, with a, a card. Uh, replicate, it replicates a card service, but there's no card, there's no legacy card infrastructure in place whatsoever. So it needs to be simple, safe, secure, no customer data, and no customer data with the scheme either. Because even if you have a token that has your uh, card number encrypted on the token, it's decrypted in the, in the card scheme so they know where to send the transaction to which bank. You need to have a scheme that encrypts that information and the information is only decrypted inside the bank's firewall, for example. And it needs to be run by the banks in the country that it serves. And it needs to have a schema that allows it to be regionally interoperable. So a Ghanaian customer can go to Nigeria or to Sierra Leone and transact. A, 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 a strict silo domestic scheme has limitations because it's just domestic. Then you need an international scheme and a domestic scheme. So regional interoperability is really important. Okay, we all know the story about mobile phone uh, and app. So you need to have USSD. Even people that have smartphones use USSD because they're habituated, they know the code. Star 742, star 1, star amount, hashtag. It's, it's embedded. And it'll be a while. We don't know how long before we trans, uh, you know, move across to apps. Um, the new Chaos uh, operating system on a $20 Chinese phone will be a game changer, but how long will it take? But there'll be a watershed moment, and everyone will be there. Three years from now, five years from now, at some point. So we need to be able to offer a digital mobile payment system that is both app that presents a QR code, barcode, or whatever, and USSD simultaneously on the same platform. As you see, now I'm starting to pitch. Blue code. I want to tell you about this and why I think it's pretty cool. First of all, its payment scheme doesn't have anything to do with plastic cards whatsoever. There's no chip and pin. There's no customer information carried around. Uh, there's no uh, compliance required with PCI compliance, no dictated interchange fees, and no foreign rule book. So any domestic scheme like this is decided in country by the regulator, by the banks. It's a domestic scheme. And the rules are set by the scheme. This is driving me crazy. OK, I, uh, AV, can you just run this? This is an example of two phones. So one is a. One is a merchant, one is a customer. This is the optical version. They capture the, the image, capture the token. It's settled. They decide to give a little tip because it's a restaurant. Instant settlement. That has gone through an entire mechanism whereby the issuing bank, the message came from the acquirer across the switch to the issuing bank, did an offset on the customer's account, reflected immediately and instantly credit in the merchant account, and it's reflected on both sides immediately. This can be done in USSD. Instead of USSD, it's that number at the bottom there, that 963 is captured instead of the, the token. And it can be a QR code, it can be NFC, it can be whatever. That's just the interface. What's important is the schema behind it and how the transactions are managed. OK, next slide. I'm going to let, can you guys drive this? This isn't working so well. So also. 
this is a scheme and anything you adopt really needs to be considered at a national level or at least with a few critical banks that can drive a scheme and own a scheme. But it has to be omni-channel. It has to be able to operate in every environment that your customers may wish to do or do now. And even including things like vending machines where you can put a Bluetooth, Bluetooth uh, dongle into a machine. Next one. So how does it work? First of all, it's token-based. It's a pre-authenticated token. So when the customer when the issuing bank's customer uh, opens their phone wherever, they're going to get four tokens downloaded and stored on their phone. They're activated when you push, when you identify yourself on the phone with your PIN or your biometric, and then it expresses. That token doesn't say who the customer is. It's got a code in there that knows where to direct it, and, it, and the customer information is only linked inside the issuing banks uh, past their firewall. So it's very secure, and because of that level of security, Small organizations and banks can use it without having to become PCI compliant. It's very flexible. It's an SDK that resides within the bank's app already. So customers don't have to download something new. It's just another menu item on your pre-existing mobile application. And it could even, it, it could even reside in a, uh, an application or a mobile, uh, mobile that's not even associated with a bank, but still point to a bank. So, and of course, iOS, Android, and Chaos Operating System. So, put that chart back up. No, 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 back. Go back a slide, please. Okay, no, next one. This is fun. I want to show that scheme. Are we going backwards here? Now we're both fighting. All right, I think we're ahead. Okay, so let's, we'll do this, this is a little video clip. And this, this shows two young ladies, one with a smartphone, one with a USSD phone at a coffee shop, and they're going to make their payment. And there's some nice music that we're not hearing right now. There's no new point of sale device required at the till point. There's no costs. That's what happened that fast. All of this interaction happened twice that fast. So the transaction transits through a schema, offsets on one account against the other, and then at whatever the scheme rules are for the interbank settlement here, number nine, Nostro Vostro accounts are reconciled with the, uh, the third-party intermediary bank, central bank, or whoever is handling it in country. That's how fast it is, and that's how a scheme works. And the scheme rules are determined by the participants in the country because Blue Code is only a technology platform. So, what are the key benefits? I think I'm just about off on time. It's a mobile payment scheme independent of foreign schemes, which I think is really important. The rules are made here, for banks here, for the public good. It en it's enabled for domestic, regional, and international interoperability. The only thing that's needed to connect that together is a, uh, is a correspondent bank agreement. It addresses the missing middle. We've got P2P on one end, which is great. MCash in, uh, in Nigeria is an example of that, but P2P has its place. But it's not a merchant acquiring system. It doesn't have the value-added services for merchants. It doesn't give you the digital transparency that you need with merchants, because with digital transparency in business, you can then do predictive lending, you can provide services to those, ins to those, financial to those businesses without ever going there. It certainly increases the, the payments ecosystem, and it certainly levels the playing field. 
and it drives financial inclusion, particularly for SMEs, because I think that's the most important aspect. It provides digital transparency to create jobs and wealth, which I think is essential. And the pre-authenticated token can be used for other purposes, because once you've got a pre-authenticated token, it says it's you and can be consumed perhaps by other services uh, to identify the customer, whether it's medical, tax, or whatever. And it's local currency without having to pay foreign royalties that are incongruent with whatever your prescribed merchant fees or local bank fees might be. And thank you. That's the end of my story. <laughs>